morning, everyone, and welcome to Sport, Leadership, and Social Change. This is our webinar series, and I'm Jen Walinga. I'm a professor in the School of Communication and Culture at Rural Roads University. This webinar has been going on for a couple of years now, uh, prompted by COVID, but continues on because of some great conversations that we are enjoying. And of course, uh, in response to a number of issues that we're facing in sport across the world, not just in Canada, but it's been fabulous to invite just amazing guests into this webinar room to have these important conversations about sport, the sport that we love. I'll introduce our guests shortly, but I always begin with a bit of a preamble around the webinar series itself, but also introducing you to some of the work we do at Rural Roads. I come to you from the lands of the Lekwungen and Kasupsan First Nations, and I always wanna spend some time acknowledging the land that we are operating on as uh, it belongs to them and we are all settlers, but uh, also because it's so important to acknowledge some of the gaps in our history and to try to rectify that, right? And reconcile how we operate within our communities, bring that back into alignment with the values that we uphold so, so well, I think typically, um, but in our, in our past, we haven't achieve that. And even though it's not our direct responsibility, we aren't to blame for some of those gaps. It's our responsibility to try to uh, bring these kinds of these uh, reconcile, right, the values that we live in and speak. And I think that's so relevant as a foundational concept for sport as well. You know, we're realizing that we've made some errors, that there have been gaps in our practice in sport as well. And this concept of reconciling with the values of sport is a really important concept to uphold throughout our, our conversations and our efforts around uh, sport as well. At uh, Rural Roads, we spend a lot of time in 300 hectares of old growth forest and really learning from the environment around us and uh, respecting that the lands that we're on and working with our Indigenous partners. I also like to highlight this concept of on our grounds, we have multiple gardens, but this bridge is one of our favorites and we use it in our School of Communication and Culture because we believe so, so much in diversity and the bridge symbolizes that, that it's important to uh, acknowledge the differences, mind the gap before you try to bridge the gap. So another core principle that we uphold at Rural Roads, but also I think it's so relevant to our conversations around sport and leadership and social change. The reason that we host this webinar here is partly because I operate at a rural roads, but because I also believe it really reflects some of the values of our learning, teaching and research model at rural roads, where we uphold these concepts of uh, being more applied and authentic in our delivery, making sure that we give our students opportunities to practice uh, with what we're preaching or what we're teaching theoretically that we do that within a community that is embracing them for who they are and is caring and supportive of their lived experiences. And that our goal is to provide people with the experiences of self-transformation in order to develop the skills to support transformation in others and beyond into our communities. So a real social purpose university. I always wanna to highlight too, you know, I was out of my boat while I was in a four today with three other colleagues. Uh, on the on the water it was glassy like this as it often is in the summer and and always reminded of the truths that exist within sport and I've even argued that I think sport is one of the most powerful endeavors to participate in and because you can participate in sport in so many ways you don't just have to be an athlete or a coach there's so many ways to participate be by, by, you know be a volunteering or officiating or spectating there's so many ways and it is the most engaging endeavor in our world, right? It, the Olympics are something that we watch more than anything else. I love seeing the numbers for the Women's World Cup as well, right? Just amazing how much we love sport in our world. And I think there's a reason for that because it embodies the mind, the heart, the soul and spirit. So, so much to learn. And I'm constantly being reminded. I was working with a bunch of sports scientists yesterday and we're talking about how how important recovery is in sport and even in the stroke of a rowing shell, right? That without the recovery, we can't actually exert. So that lesson has to be constantly, we constantly need to be reminding ourselves of that for uh, personal well being as well. And sport has really shown itself as such a vehicle for social change. We've seen all sorts of uh, efforts and endeavors and initiatives taken up by athletes, but leaders in sport as well to advance 
important concepts like diversity, like freedom, like equity. And we reflect that at uh, Rural Roads too, and really embrace that. And that's why we've wrapped our arms around this concept of as sport as a, a social change agent. Um, we partner with a lot of these organizations, but we also reflect these concepts that I think are so central to sport as an educational vehicle, diversity, education, environment, equity, health, communication, peace. We partner with a number of organizations like Game Plan, but also now the CFL Players Association, but other, a lot of our students are, are coming from a sport background. So we invite lots of partnerships with sport organizations and we have lots of opportunities for sport organizations. But what I love the most about the model here at Row Roads is that we actually acknowledge professional experience for credit. And we do that with athletes as well. So athletes who are you know, struggling to keep their education going can partner with or, or, uh, Rural Roads to keep their degree or their certification or their learning going in some way. And uh, we acknowledge the experience and learning they're gaining through sport as well. So we're at episode 26. We've had lots of other, you know, interviews and recorded sessions, et cetera. But, you know, in terms of these live webinars, this is our 26th episode and we're tackling the concept of pain, uh, the complicated role that pain plays, the relationship between pain and sport. We're going to dig into that with a lot of experts that I'm very grateful have uh, joined me today. We have Ah, the terrific Andrea Kruger. And I'll invite each of our guests to share a little more about themselves, their background. And again, as it's relevant to our conversation today uh, about sport, but Andrea is an athletic therapist. Uh, she's developing some cool curriculum online right now as well. So check out her website. And she is also has lots of experience in the realm of chronic pain. She actually was the one who initiated this topic. So I'm really grateful to Andrea. Thank you. We also have uh, Dina Bell LaRoche, who's the founder of Sport Law. You've probably seen Sport Law. They're doing some great work on a, on, they have a road show right now around, you know, the hope for sport in Canada, which I just love. And a podcast that's going on right now too, that uh, if you check out the CERC website, it's often posted there. Uh, she's also a consultant and author of uh, some wonderful books on grief and uh, she'll be talking from that perspective, of course, today, but I really want to highlight this book that she's just recently published. Zach Lewis, uh, I'm hoping he's here. I, I'm not sure if he is, but if he isn't, that's okay. I can talk a little bit about the work that he's done through his master's. And yeah, he's also a very busy club and varsity rowing co coach in Ottawa. But um, what Zach and I have been friends for a long time, but what's really intriguing is the work that he's done through his master's research on the impact that working out with others, especially through rowing, which has been described as painful at times, um, that when you're in sync with others, you actually feel perceive less pain. Pretty cool. And thank you very much for Kathy Cameron, who has joined us. She's a clinical counselor and expert in mental health and human performance, but again, with insight into chronic pain and also pain as it relates to uh, trauma and the interaction of these two things. So that would be a really interesting insight as it relates to sport as well, because I know it's something we're tackling in sport, you know, the trauma that many, um, many people, individuals, not just athletes have experienced through their sport journey. I always want to highlight, you can pose questions in the chat, but please also, if you want to put your hand up and turn your mic on and, and share in the conversation where we welcome that at any time. And we'll be monitoring the chat though too, if you have questions and, and make sure that we get to those questions. We always have a few guiding questions of our own as well, but, but uh, break in anytime you like and some contact information where you can find all these people by Googling them easily enough. We have some other things on tap here uh, on deck. Some other concepts I'd really love to dive into around referee abuse and sport leadership programs that are happening. Lots of people doing some great work around that and athletes as advocates for mental health. But also this big question that actually was prompted by me watching Shorzy, the show Shorzy. What do we value in Canada? What are our Canadian sport values? I'd love to conduct a, a giant study around that. So I'll stop sharing and let's get going with our guests. And if you want to, you can change your view, of course, of uh, who you see and when. But just checking in there, Zach. Yeah, great, great to see you, Zach. We've got all our guests. And I'm going to begin by, I always begin this way, uh, by asking people to share a little bit about their journey into sport. So 
you may be a clinical counselor or you're an athletic therapist, but how do you mesh with sport and how did you find yourself so deeply embedded in sport? What's your sport background? But why do you continue, like I do, to devote a lot of your time to sport, even if you're not, you know, competing at a certain level or involved as a coach still or, or whatever? But uh, describe your journey. And so why don't I just start with Andrea, our the pioneer of this whole program today? <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have been a mover since I was quite little. Um, there's a, my mom has a really great picture of me unlocking a bicycle while I'm wearing like a ballet outfit and my little ballet shoes are beside me. So like soccer, like organized sport, all that sort of stuff was something that I was really quite involved in growing up. Um, also just spending a lot of time outside. That was very normal. Um, I chose the sort of the sport of soccer that took me all the way through university on a scholarship um, in Edmonton and then working through that medium I started training the volleyball team there working more on like the coaching like training side of things and athletic therapy just um, was a really interesting profession and kind of just got really interested and hooked in solving problems and trying to figure out things um, and that's just where, where I ended up. Um, and the, in the way that athletic therapy relates to pain, I guess for me is, um, sort of a unique program that I helped develop and facilitate. Um, it's a 12 week interdisciplinary chronic pain treatment program, specifically for military veterans with, um, trauma exposure and mental health diagnoses, as well as living with chronic pain. And so, um, that was, uh, a whole nother level of learning, um, which is something I'm really passionate about um, in terms of bridging gaps in education and understanding as a therapist of sorts in terms of injury, physical rehab and all that sort of stuff. And the mind body connection is just something that is um, not necessarily a, a side stream conversation anymore. So um, really looking to be able to help integrate those kinds of conversations within the world of sport, because it's so much about the mental performance side of things, linking with the physical. Anyway, I could talk for hours. So I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, good. And we do, we've got lots of time. So thank you very much for that. Just taste and we'll dig in definitely into that interaction. Love it. And integration of those things. And I loved your point too, that we are it's not a side conversation or something fluffy, right? It's now being integrated into our discussion of what is performance and what does it include and evolve. Thank you. And so why don't I go to Kathy because I know your, your partners in this uh, venture as well in this exploration of trauma as it relates to pain and chronic pain. Well, thanks. Um, so I'm, I, I took a little bit of a different road. So my, my sport was individual and it was figure skating. And for about 20 years, I was a competitive figure skater, um, which led to a ton of chronic pain through um, basically falling on my butt for a very long time. And so in my early 20s, um, I got debilitating back injuries and have been living with chronic pain. So I have a very personal relationship with chronic pain. But my trajectory was more exercise and I went into, so I have an uh, undergrad in kinesiology and was a kinesiologist for a while, um, working with the University of Victoria in the Department of Athletics and worked alongside the athletes uh, and then did a master's in exercise and sports psychology um, and worked in that area, but more in exercise. So I worked in various organizations, creating exercise programming and beat my body up. I'm now in my fifties and I beat my body up to the point where I'm paying for it now. So I learned lessons the hard way. And then once I got into, and I worked with the military for about 12 years um, as a health promotions educator and learned a lot about pain and sport through them and how uh, they used a lot of sport and physical activity or, or exercise as punishment. So I learned a lot with them and then decided to move into the mental health piece. So did a master's in exercise or what did I do? Master's in counseling psychology. And now I'm really fortunate to blend the three together. And I'm starting to work with people from all walks of life with chronic pain, but a lot of athletes as well. Um, I work with them more, mostly, to be honest, it's mostly sports performance at the moment. And my chronic pain work comes with the ICBC folks who've had motor vehicle accidents and who 
um, have experienced a lot of this type of chronic pain. So I come with that. But what was interesting is in my in my learning and in, in my research, I really started introducing myself again to the nervous system, polyvagal theory, and how trauma and energy in the body, tension in the body from traumatic experiences that go as far down as childhood can have an effect with chronic pain in sport. And I find it absolutely fascinating. I continue to, to study and research this area because it is exploding. And in mental health, it's not something that we're talking about yet. So it's I'm very excited to be here today. And thank you so much for the invite. <laughs> well, it's going to be an amazing education for all of us, I think. And I can see Dina nodding because then there's a perfect little segue into the work that Dina's doing as well around grief, right? So Dina, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey? Good to see you. Wow. Well, I'm just loving the opening conversation. Can't wait to see where, where this goes. So my, my journey in sport, I mean, I, I'd like to describe that sport has been my everything since I was really, really young and not as a high elite level athlete. But I remember in 1976, uh, Kathy, you and I share a birth date, maybe I'm, I'm in my fifties too. And I was, I was really young and I was looking at the, the hosting of the Olympic games. And I turned to my mom and I said, I'm going to the Olympics too. And I was doing, trying to do the splits and she didn't have the heart to say, I don't know that you've got what it takes kiddo. <laughs> this, this dream of being able to participate in high level sport and serve in the Canadian sport community was uh, cemented right back when I was a kid. So I'm a Jill of all trades. I studied journalism um, by way of background. And in my fourth year, we had to do a, an honors uh, paper and I ended up doing it on dr drug-free sport. So talk to Dubbin and talk to Andrew Pipe and talk to Ben Johnson. And you can imagine uh, my, the, you know, the interest in wanting to ensure Jen, as you advocate for values-based sport, it just seems so intuitive. And, and that includes healthy human sports. So the first part of my career, I worked inside of sport for the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport. I was press chief with the Canadian Olympic Committee for uh, several years. And then my younger sister died in 2001, which shattered my assumptive world, which changed everything uh, for me. And so I found my courage to leave a sports sector that I loved and then pioneered, if you will, a, a different way of working and contributing to the sector, but not being kind of beholden or shackled by the invisible um, expectations and, and, and I would say um, often undernourished policies and procedures that, I, that were kind of fighting against my, my way of, of seeing the world. So I, I then became a student of thanatology. And most people, when I say thanatology, they're like, Thana what? So thanatology is the study of death and loss. And I've just completed eight university courses in, in that uh, field of study. I launched Grief Unleashed, wrote the book to, to talk about my own lived experience with grief and loss. And what's really fascinating, much like Kathy talks about a marriage of different passions, I'm marrying, I'm an integral coach. So I, I'm a professional coach credited through the International Coaching Federation. And so I feel like I'm marrying my love of human development, my passion for all things grief and loss, and then my commitment uh, to sport. And so being able to blend those three things brings me great joy, which I know so many people will say, well, how do you find joy when you're talking about grief? And I'm like, that's where I feel most alive. You know, you can't fake it when you're, you're in the midst of witnessing someone who's whose dreams have been shattered, right? Working with coaches and athletes who, who didn't meet their expectations. Or we talked earlier around the trauma to the body and the soul when, when you've had uh, multiple injuries and uh, your heart's still in it, but your, you know, your body's saying no. So yeah, so I'm, I'm just so delighted to be with, uh, with all of you today. It's such a theme of these, you know, multiple perspectives, very interdisciplinary panel today. So and that's part of it, right? That's so important to be able to understand anything. You need those perspectives. Beautiful. Thank you, Dina, for sharing as well. And next we have Zach. And uh, good to see you, Zach. Well, I'm happy you can see me. I'm, uh, or I'm happy I can see you. My, uh, my internet's not all that great. Though. We just had a storm here where I'm at, just oh. outside of Ottawa. But I'm happy to be joining you. If I do bump out, I promise I'll jump back in. I'm pretty sure we're all used to it at this point uh, in 
post-COVID life. But mm -hmm. um, thank you for the introduction, Jen. It's a pleasure to be on the chat. And I'm excited to kind of see where this goes. Um, as Jen alluded to earlier, I am a coach. So I'm the head coach of the Ottawa Rowing Club. I have been involved in sport for my whole life. Grew up in a family with multiple brothers. Uh, and we played everything from hockey to rugby to football. Uh, and after a couple of years of university rugby, I ended up switching over to rowing, which has kind of led me on a path that I'm at now. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to compete for two different schools, row for Canada for a little bit, travel around the world, rowing and coaching, um, and I've had positions coaching in Canada, the US and Australia. Um, and my master's research kind of feeds into a lot of the stuff I do on a day-to-day -day basis now. So I looked at pain tolerance and synchrony. So as people move together in partnerships or individually or in groups, how that affects their ability to tolerate pain, to uh, perform with pain, and basically how that pain is adjusted um, based on the intensity of their workout, who they're moving with, if they're used to moving with those people, and kind of looking at the psychological and the physiological effects of that pain. So all kind of things that touch on a lot of the themes that we've worked with, but I think it also kind of touches on a bigger societal theme of you know the opportunity to work with one another, regardless whether that's a friend or a family member or a teammate, and kind of go through some of the more painful aspects of our life, regardless whether that is physically induced pain or something a little bit more psychological. So I'm very excited to see this conversation goes and excited to be here. Thank you so much, Zach. And uh, there's a very good likeness of Zach. So it's almost like he's here with us on, on the video as well. Just this, you know, you're just kind of looking like a ventriloquist, but it's perfect. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so much crazy weather back east, hey? So I'm so glad you're able to make it. And um, building on some some of the work that Zach is talking about, I think uh, let's let's talk about pain. You know, we we we've mentioned it. All of you have mentioned it. You've all talked about you know the relationship it, it has with the work that you do. Um, but let's dig into the word pain a little more. What do we even mean, mean by pain or how have you seen it um, characterized in sport? So when we talk about pain and sport, how are you seeing it characterized? How is it showing up? Or can, do you have any examples of uh, how you've seen pain play out? And just turn on your mic if you're ready to go. Maybe Kathy, you can kick us off and then Andrea. Well, I guess... The, the challenge for me is I'm, I'm not immersed in sport myself, but what comes to mind and the one thing after thinking about the questions that you shared, you know, for prep and is that I do see a parallel between the military and the and sport in general and how pain plays out. And so, you know, the beliefs of suck it up, push through the pain, um, no pain, no gain. I mean, that's a classic um, can really create a stigma around I guess not doing it or working in opposition, being being perceived as weak or being perceived as a non-team player. Um, I, I see that being a little problematic, but um, that's where I think I have to sort of uh, ask somebody else to to pick it up. I think yeah. in the I'm also not like directly involved in sport at the moment, but the lifetime of exposure to that and being witness to people sort of on the sidelines of it is like um there's a lot of um I don't know valor or like over like like the the ability to suffer often is like glorified um one of the things uh for me that is really helpful when I'm working with people who are navigating pain specifically chronic pain um is to you know, get an understanding of what it means for them. So every single person that I work with, it's like, okay, well, like what, what does this pain experience mean for you? So, and every single person is going to describe it differently because pain is personal, um, subjective and like real, no matter what kind of thing. So, um, the international association for the study of pain has, I think, you know, the standardized, like, definition of pain on their website, which I can read here. It's um, the definition is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage, which is kind of a lot of words, but there's some pretty important concepts yeah. that are inferred in there in that it's sensory as well as emotional, as well as being potentially associated so the whole conversation around what 
meaning we associate with our experiences is grounded in the actual definition of pain, which links back to all of the things related to trauma and grief and the internal sort of, you know, like perspectives that get developed over a lifetime for somebody. This idea of actual damage or injury, hey, and <clears throat> and yet, like you say, we like Kathy was saying, you know, we tend to talk about it as like suffering as a good thing, and and so I do think we need to tease that apart. I, I would love us to do a little more work generally in sport around this, right, and articulate a little more specifically. I loved your comment. Pain is personal. Going to definitely be posting that out with the recording of this. And I also <laughs> wanted to just note, I meant to say this around Zach's work and everybody's work, that we will share links in our, when we post the recording, we'll also have links to all these resources that are kind of coming up as well, including that definition, right? Great. To mm-hmm. see. Yeah. Comment, comments, Dina? Well, thank you for that. Maybe where I want to, uh, what I want to offer in addition to what Kathy and Andrea have spoken to is, When I think of pain, like what triggers pain in sport, I think of psychic pain, the emotional pain, the pain of lost relationships, shattered dreams. And I, so often I give some grief and loss literacy to help the people I'm working with better understand their lived experience. And so for me, I think loss, which has, you know, been normalized in sport, right? Loss is a, is a severed attachment. So we attach to people, our teammates, our conditions, our identity, our goals, right? And, and our bodies often, what I've been, when I've been working with athletes, they, their bodies have been a means to an end often. So they've learned how to acclimatize to greater and greater thresholds, even though it may be against what their values are, or they've learned and been conditioned to, to work through it. Grief is an internal involuntary response to that loss. And so because we've been so conditioned in our North American ways to, as we said earlier, to push through it, and we've glamorized, you know, being able to withstand greater and greater load, uh, those who've tapped out and said, and tried to put healthy coping practices or boundaries around what it is they will or will not tolerate have often been shamed into silence. And what I've observed is when we can, we can give people the language to be able to describe their inner experience, they often feel relieved. I often, I often witness people crying and, and giving meaning and um, they can process what it is that they have been going through. And some of the people I work with, you know, have left sport 10, 15 years ago, but it comes back in the, in the narrative of today. So I, you know, the ways that I've been taught trauma is trauma is a wounding of the soul and athletes are often, and coaches alongside them are often uh, witness to each other's pain. And so where does all of that go is what we help to, um, what we help them process. And when you, you've got a way to describe it in the language, it loose loosens its hold. At least that's been my experience. And so, Zach, maybe you can build on that too, or comment, you know, your experience of how you're seeing it's characterized, because you do talk about um, tolerating the tolerance, right? That when you're with others, you feel supported, which really links to what Dina's talking about too, is, you know, you feel like you're supported, you actually have a higher tolerance for pain. Like, how would you describe what pain is in your context of your, your work you've done through your research, but also your experience as a coach? Well, I'm really happy Dina brought up the psychological pain of sport because I think that's something that's often missed. I mean, when you look at videos of Lance Armstrong's gritted teeth or somebody who's broken a bone or something like that, it's the physical pain that comes to mind. Um, but I think a lot of the pain that a, an athlete or somebody that's associated very closely with the sport experiences is psychological, whether that's losing the big match or not getting drafted or whoever. But one of the things that I've been most fascinated with recently is some of the work that's been done by Melinda Harrison that looks at that transition that again, uh, Dina was alluding to that when athletes do have that loss of identity and that that inability to continue to pursue whatever it is they're pursuing, whether it's a, a collegiate career, which is probably the most widely spread one, just given the number of athletes who kind of have their careers terminated at the same time, whether it's a professional career, even if it's just high school athletics, you kind of go from being able to participate in something that is a significant portion of your identity on a day-to-day basis with people that you hopefully like and care about, or if not are related to or are friends with, 
And then all that kind of concludes at the same time. And I think that that's something that in addition to being painful individually, when everybody else is going through it, not only creates a, a larger, um, I guess, emotional impact, but you're also kind of have the support at the same time of those people going through it with you. Um, nobody understands sport like the people that you participated in it with, and nobody's able to support you in the same way because other people don't get it. Uh, I think the most the frequent example, at least in my world, coaching university age athletes is kids that are no longer able to row or, or continue to participate in their sport and their parents are trying to be supportive. They don't get it. Uh, and it's, it's often a connection that we have most uh, frequently with our graduated athletes because they want to get involved some way, or they at least want to bounce ideas off you or, you know, stay in touch just kind of, they still feel like they're part of that community. And I think that that community is an enormous part of that social healing, if you will. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing the importance of space, uh, the support, the time and space to actually process some of the, the pain, whether it's loss or physical pain, but also I'm, I'm thinking how important it would be to have alumni groups, right? So that there's a group of people who really get it, who can then also mentor and support you through any kind of transition. Period. Absolutely. And I think preparing athletes or, or soon to be former athletes for that transition is something huge. Uh, it's something that's often done at the professional level or in really well-funded institutions. If I'm, I'm thinking of NCAA off the top of my head, but Canadian athletic departments or organized sport or, or most of the NSOs in Canada realistically don't have the resources or at least don't prioritize the resources to prepare athletes to go from, okay, you're here now, you're competing, you're at the top of your game, this is your full identity, your family, your significant other, your whoever else is expecting you to be a rower or a soccer player or a basketball player, whatever it is, to okay, that portion of your life's gone. The 20% that's left over is now your whole identity. What are you going to do with it? Good luck. We're, we're busy with the next generation athletes. Right? You just get cut loose. But yeah, that's what we try to, that's what I'm really aiming to do at Rural Roads too, is provide, you know, some, some opportunities to keep some learning going in this other aspect of your identity while you're competing so they can also relax a little bit and focus on performing and not be stressed out about, I have no, nothing after this which is so typical in amateur sport. Hey? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Keep going. What are some other examples of the ways, you know, I'd like to build on this idea of the no pain, no gain or toughen up or suck it up. I think it's a real issue. And I think it's getting in the way of a lot of the, the health and wellness and other aspects of performance develop and development that we're pushing for in a values-based sport world. But what is it about that? What, what makes us get stuck on, I had a friend who would say no pain, no pain, <laughs> but you know, what is it that, that hooks us into this mentality or. I'm just curious the, how, how it relates to even our bigger society, right? Like the beliefs in society. I, 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 when I hear somebody asking, you know, or somebody, I ask somebody, how are you doing? Like what's new? Oh, I'm so busy as a badge of honor that must bleed. I mean, it's, it's different, but it's the same, right? It's it's a societal belief that I don't know to to be in pain, you're working harder. You must really want it. it. It's a it's 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 something to be proud of. Versus, you know, I always think. I mean, as a health promoter, I'm thinking in terms of how do you want to move and how do you want to be when you're 90 to 100 years old? Because we are living longer, and I myself am worried about the pain I'm feeling now and what that means to be, you know, 80 years old and obviously motion or what is it? Yeah. Motion is lotion is the thing I keep in mind. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I, I think in, I think in terms of like how it reflects on our societal beliefs really, because it is just a, you know, it's a huge influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to ping off uh, a couple of things. I love the motion is lotion. I often talk about emotions, right? So our emotions need motion. So now I'm going to add some lotion to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so Zach, what you said really resonated. I, I want to give maybe some language here. I wrote a blog about this called disenfranchised grief. It was one of my first blogs, I think way back in 2017, talking to trying to give expression to uh, what I would witness when I was working with athletes and coaches, but also other people that I support in end of life care. And there is this sense of even when athletes, let's say they they're at the pinnacle of their career and then they decide to leave their team, their sport, they often experience grief because there's this loss that we just uh, spoke to. 
And if we don't have rituals, we'll probably get to that at some point, but healthy rituals that we can learn from bereavement rituals, right? Around how do we make meaning process a loss? Most of the athletes that I've, I've been supporting are in teams. And the interesting thing there is they all, they all grieve differently. They're all processing the pain differently. And when we don't have language to talk about this, we tend to superimpose our way of, of grieving onto others because we don't have the language and the frame of reference to say, oh, you might be a more cognitive uh, griever. Someone else might need to emote. Someone else be, might be more creative in their grief expression. So then we tend to compete with each other's losses. So back to Zach's point, you're just an athlete. I heard this a lot during the pandemic, right? You don't have the right to grieve. This might've been the last time I strap on my boots and, and yet they're competing against the losses of people who've had finite losses, like the death of someone they love. So because of Kathy's point around our westernized way of making meaning and valuing you know, society values, we tend to disenfranchise people. And that means disenfranchised grief, it is not socially acceptable or seen. So children, I would say athletes are often disenfranchised grievers, coaches are too, right? They're being they're being placed from one team to another. So I don't know if that resonates with people, but thank you, Zach, for, for raising that. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that one of the things that always resonates with me when people talk about no pain, no gain, it's almost like an easy way out. Um, as a coach, when somebody asks for help, if my response is no pain, no gain, I'm not providing anybody with a tool or a resource or anything to deal with whatever it is they are dealing with, whether it is physical or psychological. Um, I think physical pain um, is something that I guess kind of the the general populace is aware of at least. And, and we're aware of a lot of the integrated supports that, that again, to, to bring it back to athletes that people have. Um, if your knee hurts, what do you do? You see a doctor, you see a physio, you see an AT, whatever it is. If you're having struggles, you know, reaching a new personal best in the pool or sinking free throws in high pressure situations or whatever it might be, that set of resources isn't so clearly defined. Yes, a lot of teams start to have mental skills coaches now or uh, or sports psychologists, but coaches not only don't necessarily refer to them, but those resources aren't readily available, even if you know what they are, and they're even less known by the average person, let alone an athlete. So when somebody says no pain, no gain, and provides no further context, that to me strikes um, a feeling of unpreparedness and unwillingness to kind of take the next step to provide somebody with the supports they need or or the resources they need to kind of achieve whatever it is they're working towards well, that, yeah simplistic right it's really I, I love that it's a sign of no resources but it's a very simplistic response that doesn't dig into and and become more complex and i think there's a bit of a reluctance uh maybe resistance coming from people in sport that you know we can't expect that much from our coaches but i i think we need to and our sport leaders not just all heaping it on coaches but anybody operating within space that's supporting or facilitating and caring for those in the space of, of sport you know it is it is a holistic experience we so we do need to be thinking holistically and responsible for if you don't have the resources making sure that there are some uh, available okay important points here um and a misconstruence i'm seeing too with with uh, between pain and endurance or toughness. There's nothing wrong with being resilient and tough, but why do we misconstrue those things and tangle those things up? What else do you think is going on in the world? One, one thing for me that's a regular point of discussion is pain versus suffering. Because pain, pain itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Like it doesn't necessarily limit like people have really great abilities to function with pain in terms of physical pain um but the the sense of suffering that comes as a result of that pain i think is the more nuanced sort of dialogue um and the <laughs> when when people like it's very normal for people to want to um you know, hang their hat on an idea where it's like, oh, my knee hurts. Okay, well, like, oh, maybe it's because of a muscle imbalance or something. And then they can point at something and focus and fix 
fix it kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, when people come to physio AT, all the thing, you know, the, the resources, often they're looking for a solution and for someone to fix something, um, which isn't actually my job. I'm, I'm not there to fix anybody. I'm there to facilitate um, a pre-existing natural ability um, through education, conversation, giving language, um, and providing safety um, through therapeutic alliance so that they can create a new experience within their bodies so that they can learn to trust themselves again and continue on kind of thing. It might not be the exact same way that they continue on, but they're redefining this sense of suffering and setback and learning to work with new types of resources and new types of skills or things like that. So the, um, the idea of needing to seek something out to be fixed um, is it, just thinking of like the resources for coaches and, you know, allied sort of team sports staff and things like that. It's um, relates a little bit to the culture that's built in um, for chronic pain um, treatment. I'm, I'm not interested in managing fragility. It's like if someone's coming in and um, you know, it's like, Oh, how's the knee today? Okay. We're going to design everything around the knee because then we center the pain when really what we want to focus on is centering how, how well they're doing and every single other aspect of their life, as opposed to focusing on what the pain is taking away from that. Um, and what I wasn't necessarily taught this in school, but through my own exposure and learning, um, coming into an understanding of what's known as like a biopsychosocial model of health or wellness um, is like a foundational uh, approach to supporting someone in changing some you know mental models that they have around suffering and pain and pain is completely dependent on context as well like if you're in a boxing ring it's like for me that's I don't ever want to be in that situation but some people <laughs> really they really thrive in that situation and so it's like the context that um we experience these you know um pain experiences in is a very, very big deal, which relates again to Zach's research on being in stride and co like culture and all that sort of stuff. So mm. lots, yeah, that's lots really to powerful. unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> Andrea, you had me at pain, just this kind of reframing of it. What What's really sparking for me is uh, one of the researchers that I follow, his name's Kenneth Doka, and he's written extensively on bereavement theory. And he's a bit of a kick-ass kind of writer. He's reframing our, how we understand grief and loss. And he says, grief is the price we pay for love. Mm. So we, we think of suffering. We tend to be more positivist and reward positivity at all costs, I have found in our culture. So if we allow that the price we pay for love is grief, when something is shattered, either the ending of something, then we know we need to naturalize suffering. Mm -hmm. Now, what I speak to is not like trying to avoid or disrupt needless suffering. And back to what Zach said, and I'm curious about your research, Zach, when you're in communion with others, when people are bearing witness to your suffering, right? Giving space to the human experience, not trying to at least you. I had a client once who said, well, at least you still have another child. Mm. Well, so, so when we when we bear witness, when we're in companionship with each other, as I'm thinking, like you're rowing with your teammates and you're you're experiencing the pain and you know that they've got your back and you've worked through this, that feels um, very different than the isolation that too many of us are enduring right now because we don't have the social systems or there's been a bit of a of a sense of uh you know, putting loss in a box. So I'm, I'm curious what others might, might think about that. Well, one thing that's just come to mind now, I haven't nuanced this, so this might sound a little disjointed is attachment theory. And I don't know mm -hmm. if anybody's heard of, I'm sure it's, it's everywhere nowadays, but I'm wondering, and this is just curiosity, um, as a team, as a sports team, like the rowing team, Zach is, is mentioning in his research, when you're in synchronicity with each other, if that's the right word, um, how, how does attachment, like, do you have an opportunity to repair attachment injuries? Like if you have 
you know, if you're lucky enough to have secure attachment, then that is, you know, kind of the healthier way to relate to others and in relationship. Mm -hmm. But most of us come from an insecure attachment. So in therapy, we can, and in coaching, even you can repair an attachment just by being in a safe space with somebody and, and sharing that space and being a constant presence, et cetera. That is what a team does, right? So it makes sense to me that if you're feeling secure in an attachment with a team, that would have every effect in a positive way around pain and the experience of pain. That just, mm -hmm. it just came up. I don't know if there's research in this area. I haven't even looked at it, but like, I would assume that is what's going on too. Absolutely. And I think many of the things you've already mentioned is, you know, creating this safe space where I can develop with Andrea and all the rest of my body to support the, the healing of this injury. Mm -hmm. I can work with others to be in a safe space where I can uh, endure something that feels, you know, and painful, but it's like lactic acid pain and, um, or people that understand me or that I have space to actually grieve something that I really I've lost and loved. Um, yeah, it's, it's safe. And of course that's delving into another big topic of, well, what is safe and people are, you know, challenging all that language, but, oh, you're just bringing up such important things. I want to come back to this idea of, you know, what is pain? And I think you're all helping tease it apart really well, that there is loss pain where there's a severing. Um, there's this um, suffering, a different kind of loss. So too, where I've lost a race of, in rowing I really love rowing and I really love to win and so that's a different kind of pain you know it's a kind of a healthy pain that I'm just going to injure and work through but the, the severing or the injuring or the wounding kind of pain feels like then you need to have a safe space to really process and recover and heal from that you're doing a lovely job of pulling these concepts apart and and adding language to uh, how we can have conversations with people in sport about this kind of thing, whether they're athletes or people supporting athletes. Keep going. What is, I got this other question. Is no pain, no gain a true statement? Is it true that the only way we can develop and grow is through pain of some sort? Hmm. Maybe if we change it to K-N-O-W. Wow. <laughs> well done. I do that with uh, no fear, you know, that yeah, no fear. Yeah. I'm K-N-O-W fear. I'm yeah. Right track. yeah, I love that. Thank you. Not, That's not cool. my own idea. Someone else came up with uh -huh. that. And anyway, we but steal, we're stealing it. <laughs> That's the best form of flattery, Andrea. You know, what came to mind for me is, and there's a lot of work on PTSD. Mm -hmm. and in bereavement uh, theory, we talk a lot about post-traumatic growth. And I, I talk a little bit about that in the book because in my experience of being, you know, privileged to support high performers inside the ecosystem of elite sport, I have found that, uh, and I've been witness to people who have grown um, because they've been with the experience. It, they haven't compartmentalized, they haven't pushed it aside. They've actually stayed with the experience from a place of, of health. And not everybody's going to experience post-traumatic growth, right? I know I myself have, and it was the most excruciating experience of being able to face that severed attachment, what Kathy was speaking to in terms of attachment theory. So I would say that the, the possibility of post-traumatic growth, which is uh, Richard Tedeschi, his, his work in this area, was really helpful for me to understand. And when I worked with athletes about this, there's a slippery slope, right? Because some people will fake it and will describe it as post-traumatic growth. So it can be quite slippery. And when we understand the biopsychosocial model that you were speaking to, Andrea, it helps us kind of fill it out and say, well, is it at any cost? What are your coaches rewarding? What are you rewarding in the experience? So I, I have found post-traumatic growth to be a, an interesting way to check for ongoing growth and reconciliation that you opened up with earlier, Jen, in the conversation. trauma, loss, severing, uh, injury are realities that could occur and may be at no fault of anyone's, you know, they just happen. The key then is all that support, making sure there's space and safety to heal from it and actually grow through it. One of, one of the comments in the background of the KNOW pain, like to know it, to like go through it is, um, 
also to understand and like accept that experiencing pain, psychological pain, um, physical pain is a normal response to some type of challenge of, you know, values, ethics, expectations, all that sort of stuff, the internal um, sort of world of meaning, like our, our worldview, right? Um, those, those are normal biological kind of aspects of our lens as a human species. And um, the neuroscience supporting all of this stuff in terms of neuroplasticity and bioplasticity um, really lends itself to the idea of post-traumatic growth. I think the thing that's maybe hard for people is to know what kinds of support they need in order to be able to get to something like that, or to even have an expectation that they should, like those expectations are really hard and kind of oppressive where it's like, you you know, to, to be able like, Oh, why, why haven't you bounced back yet? Like all of those narratives of stronger, more better, like Kathy used to run a course where the point was to have a nap and it was uh, awesome that course. <laughs> to rest it's like a fitness class but like it was like scheduled it was like let's let's just like give an opportunity to rest and like create space for down regulation to create space for just like decompressing and listening and Kathy and I have had conversations around embodiment and disembodiment and how we often get very um, caught up in cerebral aspects of living like for everybody here can you feel the pressure on your seat where you're sitting can you feel how your body is like I'm sweating right now you know like (laughs) all of these aspects of my neurophysiology and my immune system and my endocrine system and my autonomic nervous system are just like doing their magic behind the scenes. And that's all a part of the pain experience, whether it's an acute pain, psychological pain, or something chronic where it's like the tissue is healed typically after three months, but the body is still signaling some type of issue of demand. And pain is actually a protective output of the brain in terms of like what the neuroscience and actual like um, understanding of how the pain experience is actually created. So I think from a neuroeducation sort of perspective, if people had like insights into these fundamental aspects of how we operate, I, f- I feel like that might be helpful for people. Like, yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> Cause we're afraid of it. You know, we're afraid of seeming weak or, you know, it's so it's stigmatized and not and requiring space and time and support is stigmatized as weak as well. We're so afraid of being weak. And, and the answer to fear is always understanding. So you're all helping the world right now. Thank you very much. To better understand pain, better understand the kinds, better understand the impact and all the ways that we can help people through it and helping to destigmatize or normalize. Uh, many of you have used that word as well. Mm-hmm. Oh. If, if I could jump in, Jen, mm-hmm. uh, just to come back to the original question is no pain, no gain required for success? I think that in some, to some extent, the answer is yes. I mean, and I really love how Andrea cha- uh, shared the, the concept of no pain as an understand pain, but how can you possibly understand something that you haven't experienced? Mm. I don't think that it should be a priority for uh, parents or coaches or teachers or whoever to prioritize being in pain or going through pain. But I think just like uh, to use a rowing analogy, if your hands are never going to experience the torsion that's in your or you're never going to get calluses. Same thing in a weight room, same thing with any sort of uh, psychological practice. If you don't learn how to do something, whether it's cooking or studying or, or talking to people, you kind of have to go through those uncomfortable growth phases. And some are certainly more painful or more uncomfortable than others. But if you don't do them and experience them, you never acquire that skill. So yes, I think it's necessary for us to experience pain in one way, shape, or form, but I don't think it is the be-all, end-all of our growth as individuals. It's not the point. (laughs) And again, back to pain, because I always think of, you know, when you're trying to actually grow your muscle, you need to go to failure. That kind of hurts. I get, you know, you feel, but to me, it's, it doesn't hurt like a broken arm would, you know? So there are these different kinds of pain as well. and, And you're all doing a great job of distinguishing 
And I think, again, it's so important to bring that converse, that language into sport a little more. Yeah, wonderful. So when we're talking about pain, I know, Andrea, you mentioned suffering versus pain, right? Mm -hmm. It's funny, I have a tattoo and it says, um, know thyself and learn to suffer. And I love it so much because it speaks to, first of all, understanding who you are and where you come from. And, and I take that more as a uh, you know, understand your adverse childhood experiences, for example, and understand how that's affected or lit up your nervous system. Mm -hmm. And then learning to suffer. I mean, that's of all the times in history, I think now is a really good time to learn and suffering under Buddhism is, is defined not like I thought it was like mm. suffering on a on a cross or, or being nailed to something and just suffering. It's just discomfort, right? Learn to be uncomfortable. And that's where I, I, in my head, I'm always asking this question, do we have to push to pain or do we push to discomfort? And, mm -hmm. you know, change can happen either way. So to me, pain, to me, it, pushing to pain means you're, you're moving over a tipping point, right? Pushing to discomfort means you're uncomfortable, you're learning from it, you're pushing your limit, but you're not risking anything. So I don't know if I'm just, you know, immersed in the semantics of it, but oh, I think if, if we, if we know thyself and we learn to suffer, um, that shifts our perspective around pain as, as everybody here has suggested already. But I, I just wonder about that discomfort versus pain thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dina. Well, you know, I love it. So my husband's a pilot and he would say, like they teach in, in Canada anyway, they teach people, pilots, how to recover from a stall. And in the US, they don't do that. So they talk about it. They make it a really cognitive exercise. So as you were speaking to it, it's like, how do you know when the plane, he taught me how to fly. How do you know when the plane is about to stall unless, you know, as Zach said, you, you've kind of been in that experience and then you're you're normalizing it and it's uncomfortable because then you, the nose is going to go down. But if you've got the resources and you know how to navigate in that experience, then to Jen's point, we don't have the fear because the fear is what paralyzes us. It prevents us from living this, you know, amazing life. It also creates all that kind of psychic pain that then becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, you know, I'm a mom of three and I, I coached a lot at the younger levels, right? And I, I think our community sport experience, like if we could imagine a future where the coaches didn't make the game, the outcome about them. And so we just let the little people play because these kids are learning that a loss is bad. They feel it in their parents on the car ride home. They see the shock and awe. And then when they cry, cause they've lost that dream. What do we say to them? Don't cry, but that's what their body needs to process the outcome of this shattered right? Dream this attachment that they had. So then they suck it up. Right. So I think we have some work to do and we just have to look at kids. Kids understand how to process loss peekaboo and, you know, they come running to you. So I, I think the kids can be our greatest teachers. <laughs> Love it. Absolutely. And you brought us back to the cultural, the values, beliefs, assumptions that underpin how we operate in our world. And so we're all challenging those and challenging the world to challenge those concepts in sport as well. Good, good, good. Uh, how important it is to better understand, make sure the resources are there, experiences. I mean, back to transformational learning, that's another concept that discomfort word is, is in the theory of transformational learning. So we make our students very uncomfortable, <laughs> but we don't tip them over into you know total trauma either. Uh, but you got to feel that discomfort. Okay, I want to go back to Kathy because Kathy, I've been wanting to ask you more about the impact of trauma on our perception of pain. So uh, Zach's talked a bit about being within within that supportive environment, you actually feel less uncomfortable, uh, yeah. which I've definitely experienced. But tell us about trauma and the impact that has. What I know, well, I started studying this probably a few years ago um, under the tutelage of Mark Grant, who is, I don't know if, I'm sure some of you have heard of EMDR. It's a form of therapy that deals with the nervous system. So it's a, it's a bottom-up approach to therapy. It's not talk therapy, but it works with the brain and bilateral stimulation. And although there's no research out there yet, I firmly believe exercise is a form of EMDR. That's how it was born. Um, but the reason I go there is because Mark Grant's strategies and protocols around chronic pain and EMDR have been 
absolutely. It's, it's almost like witchcraft. Like I'm just going to share just a quick story um, of a client that I am working with currently who came in uh, with a 10 out of 10 in pain two weeks ago. And we can't work with physios yet, can't work with anybody because he has so much anxiety around this pain and he's so guarded, but he has been a yoga practitioner for 20 years and he wants to get back to it. So it took two sessions and we worked with EMDR um, for those two sessions and de-escalation strategies for his nervous system. And the last time I saw him, his pain was a zero out of 10. And he's now able to go to physio and work through the injury and not brace. And he's engaging in all his poses in yoga. Um, so uh, as far as perce I can't speak to your initial question, Jim, was perception, perception of pain. I'm not, I'm going to leave perception out of it right now. Um, but when somebody comes in and they're experiencing, let's say a 10 out of 10 and it's chronic and it's been there for a while, the first thing I start assessing is what were your adverse childhood experiences? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with the ACEs study, but it is the most impactful study that I think any health practitioner should be very immersed with because it speaks to our regular normalized experiences in childhood and how those experiences cause tension in the nervous system or dysregulation that does not get processed. So it sits there. And over time, we add to it, it can be complex trauma, which is one trauma after the other, that's more of a big T situation, or just, hey, I was almost hit by a car when I was in kindergarten kind of trauma, which is maybe a big T, but probably if it's single event, it might be a little T. Anyways, these things pile on. And so my, my, Thinking about this podcast and what we are going to talk about, my initial question is, what motivates people to get into sport in the first place? A lot of people get into exercise as a way to uh, uh, cope, cope with emotional pain. And that then leads to exercise abuse. And that was my initial idea for my master's, but it was it was. My advisor at the time said, nobody's even exercising. Why would we talk about exercise abuse? But we see it and I still see it. And I see sport as being used as that for many people. And so my question is, is like for pain in sport, how much of it is self-harming? How much of this is a uh, coping mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. Unhealthy coping mechanism. And I see marathon running that way. Like I, I do have some opinions and I'm trying to keep them at bay here, but so my question is, what motivates one to get into sport? And then as they get into the system and get into competition, and speaking only to a few coaches, because I do work with athletes and hear some horror stories, we've got abuses of all sorts in coaching. And so then there's trauma on top of trauma, right? So then the athlete gets injured, and now that becomes chronic. And now really what they do have to do, which many people do not want to do, is go to therapy and work on the initial adverse childhood experiences and work their way up to present day. That is hard work. And that I do believe needs to happen before this chronic pain can, can abate or can reduce or can disappear. So I, I, I think I'm, I don't know if I've answered your question 100%, so I apologize, but I, there's a direct link to trauma in the body uh, from childhood on and chronic pain. Absolutely. Yeah. Not, not even debated anymore. Yeah. And yeah. maybe the experience of pain and better than a perception. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So processing and there's your back to Andrea's, you know, the integration of mind, body, heart, and soul. Yeah. yeah. Very important again, for everyone in the sports space to understand and appreciate I've seen so many athletes uh, denigrated for being mentally weak or, well, you know, they just can't seem to pull it together because they keep having these injuries or it's an excuse. And meanwhile, I know this kid has trauma that that's never really been addressed or acknowledged. Oh, it's so dangerous. So then it's like you say, layers of trauma on trauma. Yeah. I am. Um... I, I, in preparation for our conversation today, I put together a little survey for people, you know, in the community that I'm connected to, to be able to like voice, voice sort of like what they think the value of understanding all of these ideas would be. And um, a couple of them were specifically just athletes. Some of them were coaches and athletes. Um, it's like, it would, one, one person replied, it would have been useful to know when to quit playing. And so when the coping strategies of like 
I'm going to demand more of myself. I'm going to override my body. Like it's all just about, it's a mental game. Like suffering is not a thing. I dis, I disassociate from my body kind of thing in order to achieve the outcome of what, you know, like Dina was mentioning, um, the tying, tying that values-based conversation back in where it's like, even for my own experiences at university level and provincial level soccer player, it's like, I mean, I was younger then and had really no concept of what values were and stuff like that. All I know is that I was supposed to show up and try my best kind of thing, you know, like at, at what expense. So I didn't really have the insight or awareness to maybe hear or know what those expenses were necessarily but like it's like the one thing that I knew how to do was work really really hard and I got a I got a lot of secondary gain from that like there's validation there's acknowledgement and this you know the culture and all that sort of stuff but like if someone else if another if another aspect of that person's life is you know not really giving them what they need I think to Kathy's point here of like the the compensation of sport or like um exercise abuse and all that sort of stuff it's like people don't people engaged in that type of activity don't see it as a form of self abuse they just think that they're like outperforming other people kind of thing so it's like when the veil is slowly lifted and it's like oh learning you know, like some of the technology that's available, like heart rate variability, you know, with from more of like a physiology sort of background that helps to like objectify some of the internal states, which might be a softer sort of side door approach for people to start to learn how to like actually tune into what their body is talking and saying and stuff like that. Like, I think those are really valuable tools, but not, yeah, it's like not everybody joins sport for the same reason, which is a really great point but um it would have been useful to know when to quit playing that that answer um really stood out for me but you mind if I add something to that because that's awesome I'm I'm right now uh, working on a writing project and I'm taking the exercise culture because that's what I know not so much sport but I do think that they're related and um I'm trying to integrate exercise into mental health practice and to do that efficiently and effectively we need to take down the culture of fitness we need to call it out for what it really is because right now it is on steroids. And I know this culture more than I know the back of my hand. So to do that, we need to, and so now I'm recreating an exercise program for various mental health issues. And the reason I bring it up is is to speak to your point, Andrea, I'm trying to integrate, I I haven't done it yet 100%, but I'm integrating somatic therapy with weightlifting. Mm -hmm. And what that means is instead of being disembodied, instead of just sitting there and and doing a biceps curl or a seated row and not really thinking too much about even, you can think about the muscle, but, and, and we do tend to feel the muscle, but to actually engage with our nervous system, to actually uh, pinpoint where we're feeling dysregulation, using somatic exercises to regulate and then get into your lifting technique. It's a before, during, and after situation where you're applying these strategies from the mental health therapies into exercise and and sport, I think would be an amazing marriage between therapy and exercise and sport. And it would teach athletes to always to become embodied because I bet you there's a lot that are disembodied. Mm -hmm. They're embodied and able to, to identify dysregulation. Now they're able to process even emotion, grief, every emotion you can think of while they're in sport. Like that would be amazing, right? Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I get really excited. I think there is such opportunity here. Yeah. Well, again, I believe sport is the answer to everything always, but and <laughs> in, in sport, you know, we need to address like you're trying to and, and expand our understanding, equip people with resources. You know, I get people to consider that, hey, maybe this athlete is doesn't really have a healthy relationship with sport and I could help them find a healthier relationship with them. So expanding our understanding in sport, but also through then understanding through sport, it can be just such a great avenue for yeah. All learning. Yeah, and I'm sure we've all had fortunate experiences in that regard where it's actually helped us heal. Uh, we have developed a healthy relationship or we've been able to process some trauma or grief. Yeah, we've learned some great skills and tools. Mm, wonderful. Um, 
do you think, and we'll keep coming back, I've got other, other questions, but this is one that's just coming up for me is, I think of, you know, many of you will probably remember the Kayla Strug from uh, 96 Olympics, little gymnast being coached by uh, the, the guy, what was his name? Ka Ka Caroli, Caroli. Oh, no. Bella Carola. Bella, yeah. yeah. So he's being coached by him. She breaks her foot, right? Yeah. And then she still completes a vault. She doesn't want to, but she's being encouraged to by the coach, like we need you to in order to win the gold medal as a team. And she does it. And she lands this vault on a broken foot. And then she's being carried away and she's completely traumatized by it, right? And so I've seen recently people post that, you know, and be, oh my God, I remember watching and kind of feeling like, yeah, wow, good job, but kind of unsettled, right? But nowadays, wouldn't we just go, what the hell, and, and stop it? Do you think we've advanced or is this no pain, no gain and, you know, push through the injury? Is that still prominent? Uh, I'm thinking of Mike Webster as well, Iron Mike. He's the the athlete that had, you know, such a damaged brain that it, it was the, um, it's what prompted the movie concussion and the whole exploration of concussion in the NFL. But, you know, this guy was, was lauded for his ability to, you know, tape with a gorilla glue, or gorilla glue, gorilla glue back his tooth into his mouth, yeah. things like this, right? Duct tape his feet and crazy stuff. Mm. Are we advanced? Are we learning? No, <laughs> <laughs> we've got far to go. <laughs> yeah, I think we do. I honestly do. Like we're still celebrating that. I, it's funny you even bring that up because I was listening to an audio just yesterday that celebrated that exact event in the Olympics that she did this. Wow. What an amazing athlete. She pushed through it. Had, and I was just to the audio book. I was just like, are you guys kidding me? Like, is this a joke? Yeah. That's child mm -hmm. abuse, I think, but mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Uh, and, and this is just as somebody that that kind of identifies as the new generation coach. I think that there still is a lot of uh, perception that that we do celebrate things that that are remarkable feats of whatever. I mean, NHL players that get their teeth smashed out and come back to the third period or, or whatever you may have. But I do think that the conversation and the perception is changing. I think the new era of informed athlete of informed students, informed employees kind of understands what that limit should be and, and, and where they're allowed to say no. I mean, everybody that kind of goes through their first job has to go through this horrendously long and boring WSIB training where they learn about their right to refuse safe work. And it's kind of something that like we joke about, but why does that practice not transfer to our sporting life or our personal life or our other work life or anything else? If we need those boundaries in order to be safe and productive and valued in our environment, I think you're starting to see this kind of global shift of people that are willing to say no, willing to say, I need a little more support or, you know what, I, this isn't worth it. I do want to be able to whatever it is, walk for the rest of my life or chew my food for a sport audience. But uh, any one of those things that does have more of a repercussion for us than just, uh, you know what, I won this game. Mm. I, I th think I agree with like, I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I was touched by what you said, Kathy, around comparing sport to military practice, right? And just the command and control kind of approach that we lauded for, for all the time. And it, it to me, it's the context so learning about myself, learning about my body, my limitations and where I'm at, pushing myself to that edge before I stall out, right? And, and I would say this next generation who I do quite a bit of work with, I have three of them living under my roof. They, they teach me all the time around what is respectful, what isn't. I, I've, I always ask the athletes I was supporting, can coach put her hand here? Where are you hurt? You know, to have your body talk talk to you about what is and isn't um, uh, available to you today, especially, for instance, with young girls who are prepubescent, some have periods, some don't. So giving them some language around all of that, I think is super important. Where I think we have even further to go to your point, Kathy, is educating the mentors and the femters and the people who are in positions of power and authority. Can we ensure that they have the literacy, the emotional literacy, right? The the knowledge that uh, that we've been sharing here today so that they accept the privilege of being in that position of authority in front of these often, you know, 95% of sport is played out in community. 
And most of these people are under the ages of 18. So they are vulnerable people. We're not talking about the 1%, right? But those one percenters learn about what is going to be acceptable and not acceptable. So they, in community, and the vast majority of community people, as well intentioned as they are, don't have nearly enough of the training and education, right? Yeah, and they're just inheriting from their past. So it just keeps replaying. We need to exactly. interrupt, intervene. Yeah, sounds good. And what are some of the barriers to this informed nature of sport participants what are some of the facilitators so what are we seeing working what's getting in the way i would say right now i'm not sure sport is it's it feels almost a little un, unsafe to really challenge um there's there is a bit of backlash when you really challenge these kinds of uh, values or practices that are happening uh at the at the i don't even know what to call it, hate hierarchy so but you know at the high performance there. I guess yeah um so we're, I don't know that we're we're necessarily moving what else is getting in the way of of that kind of informed leadership the, mm -hmm. the education what do you think let's talk about the barriers first and then talk about the good news because hopefully Zach will come back on as well you know what's working what's getting in the way well I'm just going to throw it out here we need to measure a new holistic bottom line right we can't just metal uh, measure money and metals we have to measure morals and morals include safety so money metal morals what are the resources what are the outcomes we're looking for and then how are we going to get there until we measure a holistic bottom line we're going to I think commodify and we've been doing this forever we're going to commodify the humans inside the experience mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to measure those things, but you can. I mean, it's, all we have to do is look to education. We do have wonderful criteria that we use to measure uh, different kinds of performance. You know, it just means you have to be a little more nuanced and thoughtful and not, as Zach said earlier, you know, just kind of lazy about uh, the simple response. Okay. What else gets in the way? I think the knowledge translation from academia, like, I graduated in 2014 from my undergrad and there wasn't really anything taught outside of a biomedical model of care and bi biomedical models of care are really reductionistic where it's like, oh, you just have, you have chronic headaches, you know, they don't necessarily, um, the healthcare system doesn't teach like a um, multi, you have to specialize in order to be able to approach a patient or a client with a multi-pronged um, perception of care. Um, so the fact that that is still, that biomedical model is still the normal um, route, I guess, of education. So I think, um, like Zach was saying, I think there, like, I, I would include myself in, in the like new wave of you know, conversation and therapy sort of perspectives of like, okay, well, if I'm able to take some courses and educate myself on different ways of speaking, like um, using the, like open-ended questions and like even learning how to dialogue in a specific way that centers the person in front of me rather than as I'm taught in school to be like, oh, this is what's wrong with you. Okay, like let's just do X, Y, and Z and be prescriptive about it in order for meaningful and sustainable change to happen from like a integrated sort of lifestyle kind of not necessarily in a competitive sport perspective, but even like people engaged in healthy health promotion lifestyle aspects. It's like for them to be able to make the changes sustainably, they have to have a sense of autonomy and trust in their um, pursuits, because they're just so afraid of hurting themselves again. And then, you know, all, that injury takes away from maybe it's their job. Like, um, like I don't mountain bike because I use my hands for work and I'm so afraid of breaking my collarbone kind of thing. Like that's a value based decision um, that impacts my like life kind of thing. So I think if people dig into current research, um, which most practitioners are required to take continuing education courses, but um, if they're not looking into aspects of biopsychosocial care and person-centered care and trauma-informed care and just learning how to actually use language and prioritize therapeutic alliance, I think um, that progress is gonna be slow without that. 
Yeah. And so what's working? What is helping translate? So, I mean, God, all these webinars, there's podcasts, there's lots of information floating around. We are, um, even the conversation as a platform for sharing yeah. research has been really, I think, powerful, but people are seeing it a little more. So that's helpful. Expectations. Yeah. People are calling it for it. You know, come on. And, you know, the resistance is I only, you know, I want to focus on tactics and skill. I don't have time to do all this other airy fairy stuff. And yet it's cool to be a well-informed coach nowadays, increasingly. How do we keep that pressure on? What else is working? Uh, what's working about the bottom line concept that Dina brought up? So why do we cling to this crazy measure of metals? I don't understand the metal table even is so irrelevant in every population. It's relative to size, you know, it's so stupid. But why do we cling to it? What's working to move us off of that and expand our measures of performance? Yeah. Well, it's easy. It's, oh, go ahead, Kathy. Oh, no, no, you go, you go. Well, I was just going to say it's easy. It's observable. It's outside of us. We can wrap our minds around it. So much of what we've talked about here is the internal human experience. And, you know, when I think of the therapeutic alliance, one of my teachers, uh, Harvey Tochinov, he's a world leader, he, he asked the most beautiful question. So imagine if all of us ask this question when we're dealing with our clients, our patients, our children, our athletes, uh, what do I need to know about you to be able to provide you with the best possible care? Yeah. When, when I learned it's dignity therapy, when I learned this mother of all questions, back to Andrea point around powerful questions can open up right someone's soul and maybe to earlier point Kathy that the pain the psychic pain is actually contributing the the contributing factor to the physical pain so what do I need to know about you well I I was harmed when I was a child or neglected or my mom died so that dignity-based question Jen is so powerful Founded on the assumption that you are an educator in that role. You know, you are there to support and facilitate and understand and work with this unique human being. To well, here's what I'd love. What if we all learned that? So <laughs> educator, friend, you know, spouse, child, like, what do I need to know about you in this moment so I can be the best possible friend, the best possible parent? I know it sounds like sportopia, but someone's got to dream the big dream. Dream the dream, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny you mentioned that because the irony in my head in therapy, like in, in my mental health practice with my fellow mental health practitioners, the to, to re paraphrase what you've said, we call it person-centered approaches, mm -hmm. right? Or client-centered approaches. Yeah. So client yeah. comes in now, I don't medicalize mental health and I'm one of little who don't. Yeah, I love that. And I can't really go to my conferences and I can't work with psychiatrists and I can't work with psychologists because I do not believe in diagnoses. I believe in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And we've socio, socio-culturally, we have created these words like depression, anxiety, they're all medicalized terms, right? But to have a client come in and ask that question or get to know your client in a way where now you're basically focusing on their needs and not medicalization. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, for, for Andrea's work, I'm assuming you see somebody coming in saying, hey, I've got a pulled hammy or I've got a, you know, tennis elbow and they're coming in with a diagnosis. And now we've automatically, and I'm not speaking to you, pigeonholing them into, okay, well, you've got this, we'll do A, B, and C, and you'll be on your way. And therapy is the same. And I'm wondering how that how that resonates in our topic like to be i guess athlete centered and how would that relate in in this transition into a new way of doing things in sport i always like to say sport centered because when we privilege one individual in the space right it, it causes problems but it's really about a healthy sport experience and so if you put that at the center or learning or development you know it's that then ensures that you treat them as human beings we're in relation we're we're partners in this uh, endeavor we're not i'm not your boss telling you what to do which is <laughs> no one ever asked me how they could help me as an athlete it's so funny eh? what yeah. you know about you that was never asked uh, we've lost Zach, unfortunately, but, you know, I'll chat with him after as well, but I'm glad he was able to throw a few nuggets in there. Um, I really love, too, how we're wrapping this, and, and I also wanted, I mean, we're almost done, but I wanted to invite anybody, and I know Lisa sent a little a comment to me from Roy BC, and I know Lisa well, but um, about these kind of interesting cases of individuals 
around pain that we can learn from. But I also always want to leave us, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa in a second. I just want to remind us all that, you know, we all have power to change things in our sports system. What I'm loving about this conversation is we're in an echo chamber, obviously. We are all very interdisciplinary. We're comfortable with ambiguity. Like we're trying different things and we're not locked in. But we're also compassionate to those who are reluctant to be interdisciplinary. You know, the medicalized, there are reasons for that. And we're trying to be compassionate, understand what that is so that we can bridge that gap, right? And also the fear thing and the easy thing. And, you know, because we're too busy and all these uh, these good reasons people have for doing things that may not be as sustainable. So I think that's a really good message you're all communicating to our audiences. But Lisa had a really cool example of, a, of an athlete. And I, I wanted to invite her to share her, her example because it's just something for us all that, Ponder. Go ahead, Lisa, and welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by saying I'm catching so many little things that I'm, my role at Rowing BC is both um, coach education, well, two of the things that I do are coach education and para rowing, and I feel ridiculous talking about para rowing in front of Jill, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. um, but so there's lots of little tidbits I'm grabbing a hold of, like the what do I need to know about you to provide the best quality blank that is it's going to be used in coach workshops so thank you for that mm -hmm. um and i think that in para coaching it's much easier to start those conversations when you've got somebody who's not typical mm -hmm. to have the conversations about what they need in, in particular and ask them direct questions and and come up with a collaborative relationship between coach and athlete. So I, I love all of these things that you guys are sharing. The athlete that I mentioned to Jen in my, um, in the, excuse me, in the chat was somebody I coached years ago. It was a young woman um, who didn't have any physical experience of pain, like no nociceptors kind of thing. But when she pulled a 2K, which is like the most <laughs> brutal part of rowing and where you're dancing with anaerobic for a long time and and dealing with physical pain she still had the same kind of limbic response that all of her teammates did in the third 500 mm -hmm. so she would have emotional pain and fear and nausea um and that situation was really interesting for her teammates to see because they understood what was going on for her and for us coaches to come up with even more ways of talking about the experience of when these athletes are pushing themselves, how do we give them the tools to, to be resilient in that space that's so hard? <laughs> so I, I just thought I'd share that. And if you have comments or ideas, I'd love to hear them. Well, one thing is, I mean, from a, that's, yeah, a great example of the idea that like pain is not necessarily dependent on nociception. Nociception is a very technical term, but for folks where it's like your body has, you know, sensory neurons and that pay attention to changes in chemical and um, temperature, as well as um, like e even like tension and speed of contraction and sort of like the internal monitoring system, that, that is kind of what you're talking about with nociception. Um, but we don't, have to be reliant specifically on nociception in order to experience a pain experience. So um, I just wanna offer a bit of background around that word, but um, the physiological um, responses in the body from the autonomic nervous system in response to that type of stress, which is a word that we haven't really talked about necessarily today, but very much is a part of the conversation in the background is like so much um, related to how the systems level sort of integration of the body and it's like ability to protect and um you know maintain the priority of keeping you alive whether that means like making like when people faint right it's like a the vasovagal response you your body is taking over to keep you alive and like you don't get a choice kind of thing so um hearing that this person's nociceptive feedback might not have been the norm, but still her body is, you know, showing up and um, signaling like ways of managing that stress is like just such an amazing testament to like 
the nature of the body and how it will figure out a way to kind of like make sure that you as a species are, um, you know, prioritized in some capacity, whether that's in alignment with the outcome that you're looking for is another conversation, but like, it's always going to show up for you. And the meaning that you associate to those responses is sort of where the magic happens, I think, for a lot of folks in terms of learning how to, um, I guess, validate that experience, learning how to work with it rather than see it as a problem and stuff like that. So yeah, that's really cool. Thank you. And you've confirmed that in the third 500, I am almost going to die. Is that also true? <laughs> but also that there are limits. Your body is experiencing the fact that, you know, I, I now am running out of, right? I'm mm. beyond anaerobic. And, and so it's not pain. It's something else. These limits that we're experiencing that could eventually kill you. <laughs> they won't. But, you know, I think that's the other piece of it, of distinguishing the pain from pushing through limits. <laughs> and thank you, Lisa, for bringing up para as well. I mean, that's Sam Heron's work too, about everything we need to learn in order to deliver sport well, we can learn from our para athletes if we just pay attention. Yeah. Other final words, because we'll, I mean, we could talk forever and we definitely need a, point, a part two, I think, because it's, um, I think this is one of these topics that a lot of people would like to weigh in on as well and really dig into things like stress limits, kinds of pain more into loss the severing and all the responses that that needs we need to destigmatize to uh, ensure people can process mm -hmm. final words well I'm, I'm happy to maybe offer a few things this has been so incredible and and so appreciating all of the intersections at which we're speaking to and and something that I'm particularly interested in is how then does all of that apply to people of color, for instance, mm -hmm. right? yeah. or athletes uh, with different abilities. So I'm, I'm also thinking that that could be part of the part two. What's really interesting for me is who, who loves, I, I love understanding the experience of someone after they've suffered a severed attachment. And there's some, uh, there's a really beautiful book called The Grieving Brain. And just to back up what you shared here, when we cry tears of joy, you know, the salinity in it is clear. When we cry tears of pain, the alkalinity in it is higher. So our bodies, you know, keep the score. Our bodies know how to process experience. And if we could help people understand that grief is a natural involuntary response to a severed attachment, we could understand pain is there as our friend to tell us what is and maybe we're not ready for. I think that would really uh, shift the conversation. And I'd, I'd love to read if I can. She's an, a poet from Vancouver Island, Jen, and I'm happy to share the link uh, with you. Her, po her poem's called Healing. So it's very, very short. May I share that with your listeners? Yeah, yeah. So here's what she says about healing. Healing does not happen with force. It is intuitive and deeply wise as if it keeps its own noetic rhythm. Healing takes the, sh the shape of a flower's patient opening and the surrender of leaves to the turn of season. Healing shows us to trust the process, only to sense when the time is right for her infinite compassion to move through dark places and to turn pain into light. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I think that ties a bow quite nicely <laughs> on our session. Thank you very much to all of our wonderful guests, Dina Bella Roche, Kathy Cameron, Andrea Kruger, and Zach Lewis, and our guests. Great to see you, Clarence. Haley, thank you. I, I saw Paula Baker from CERF. That's great. I know she's got a new position there. Lisa, wonderful for you to join in. And my good friend, Jill, great to see your smiling face on there. And to all our other listeners into the future of the recording, uh, we welcome feedback and we'd love to have questions. I really do think we need probably another session on this kind of stuff. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to Ariana for her support through the webinar as well. Take care. We'll see you. Thank soon. you. Bye.